the kind of AI that we see in the Terminator is nowhere near possible at present. We are very far from achieving any form of, say, artificial general intelligence. Dear friends, welcome to yet another edition of Forum 2000 Online Chat. Innovators' constant defiance of beliefs, prejudices, and even rules has been vital to the development of technology, tremendous economic growth, and even freedom and democracy. However, we live at times, in times where, as before, there is a fear of technology, and we feel that the development of artificial intelligence is getting out of control. The power of platforms, autonomous weapons, surveillance systems, and what many consider to be an ongoing AI arms race, leave us wondering if it's time to set limits, and if it's even possible to do so. To discuss these issues, joining me today is Trisha Ray, who is a fellow at the Observer Research Foundation's uh, Center for Security, Strategy, and Technology and whose work focuses on geopolitics of emerging technologies, AI governance and norms, and technology standards. Trisha, welcome, and thank you for making the time to join us, especially as we take part at this year's Forum 2000 in Prague. Uh, I look forward to the conversation. It's nice to be here. <laughs> Trisha, may I just say that I'm so very glad that we're actually having this chance to um, discuss mm -hmm tech from a closer perspective, especially after our morning pl uh, panel that we had today. And so I prepared a few questions mm -hmm. um, that I hope will help us, but also our audience, our listeners, uh, to really kind of dive deeper into some of the things that I've mentioned earlier in the introductory remarks. I would be curious to hear your thoughts on whether the fear element is actually something that can change, mm -hmm. especially when we start pushing companies and platforms for more transparency and accountability. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start from that? So fear usually comes from a lack of transparency, a lack of understanding of something, or a lack of uh, certainty about how things will play out. Um, for example, when it comes to AI, uh, and I think some of these statements that have come out of, uh, come from prominent individuals has aided this perception, right? Uh, Putin said that uh, the nation that leads AI will rule the world. Um, I've been guilty of using that quote in some of my <laughs> papers as well. Um, Elon Musk said uh, that AI can be more dangerous than nukes. Mm. I mean, you have these public figures kind of almost fear-mongering through the way they're presenting this technology. Uh, AI's PR problem also extends to the fact that media will often report on papers that are just proof of concept, okay? They're not peer-reviewed yet. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still a frontier idea, they still need to be verified, but it's presented as, okay, here is proof that things are going wrong, and it's just, it, it gets, it kind of um, snowballs out of control, essentially. So a lot of this is essentially a PR issue as well, right? It's come to the point where your average individual does not have that kind of nuanced understanding of what AI is. Uh, the, the kind of AI that we see in the Terminator is nowhere near possible at present. We are very far from achieving any form of, say, artificial general intelligence. So all of that, I think, needs to be, it's, it's a responsibility that we as individuals uh, have to add that nuance in how we think about and talk about these issues. Absolutely, and especially when you think of not only how leaders or certain individuals play on the grand concept of things like AI, but also how users, citizens in general, when they come in close contact with, say, technological tools, um, there is this 
sense of am I using this correctly or mm. am I uh, going to be um, perhaps punished for using a specific platform or specific tool. There is also the sense of user-based fear mm -hmm. that I find um, also kind of gets neglected in the conversations around uh, how this whole <laughs> tech platform company uh, view on, on, on the concept of fear. Mm -hmm. And I think I don't, we're not doing enough to address that kind of user's uh, base fear that perhaps is generated as a result of, uh, as a result of these existing uh, mm -hmm. realities, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I think what plays into it is the fact that uh, once you, once you fall into a social media or a YouTube rabbit hole, uh, you kind of reinforce what may have been just glancing fears. You'll find plenty of content that caters to, say, uh, a view that you've started developing about tech. Um, and I think that also goes back to some of the content regulation issues we were talking about this morning, right? Uh, the difference between content that brings awareness to some issue but is still taken down because it addresses the issue, but then content that is actually dangerous and fear-mongering continues to stay up. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's complicated. It's a vicious circle, I feel mm -hmm. like. Uh, I guess that's a good sort of segue to my next question, which is on surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on solution mechanisms. You know, the recent NSO group decision, for instance, can be one way to dive into this question. Uh, or maybe you have seen or uh, have been part of conversations around um, what can be done with this extensive reliance, sale, use uh, of surveillance technology. Mm. Yes, that's a complicated um, issue right now. In recent years, especially, I think during the pandemic, there's been this rise of smaller private companies that are essentially guns for hire, sometimes for non-state actors, but also for governments, uh, for cyber operations of various kinds, including espionage and surveillance. The NSO group decision is momentous, like adding a company like this to the entities list is an important move towards making sure that these companies are held accountable for the ways their technologies are used, right? Um, I also kind of want to zoom out and talk about, uh, this is a, a little abstract, but power in the world we live in stems from control, from the ability to keep secrets. So national security is based on governments knowing more than ordinary citizens do. Uh, company secrets, like uh, it's, it's, there's always an element of asymmetry in the way we operate, right? Uh, and therefore, privacy is all the more valuable. The powerful get to protect the secrets, but our private spaces, our thoughts have become kind of open ground for governments, for companies uh, to intrude. And again, going back to the conversation we were having this morning, uh, this is the value equals control concept underlies the current iteration of the internet, which is Web 2.0. It's interesting to think about whether what we think of as Web 3.0, which is more decentralized, uh, could change some of these dynamics, these asymmetries. Still theoretical, but it'll be interesting to see if that ends up actually being better for us overall. I'm really glad that you brought up the topic of um, decentralized web because this is something that I keep hearing in conversations with technologists, with uh, people who work in the digital security field, people who are really tired of um, dealing with uh, platform 
not being accountable to their users. So I think really this may be the um, next point of conversation for years to come because mm -hmm. the idea of creating something that is user generated, uh, which kind of goes back to like how the web World Wide Web was created, right? Like in the beginning, the whole idea was to create this user-generated yes. uh, platform or network that will bring users together. And yet, here we are, years, decades later, uh, complaining <laughs> <laughs> and having a really hard time finding solutions mm -hmm. to our problems. So I appreciate you uh, bringing up the decentralized web. And I really hope that in perhaps next conversation that we have in a few years, we will have something more feasible to mm -hmm. talk about and, mm -hmm. and, and talk about and, and, and show that this indeed is the solution or you know can be a solution. I'm going to uh, move to the final question. And that's uh, going back to the artificial intelligence. Um, this to me is <clears throat> an area that I find developers and companies most secretive about. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about the fear angle, but also the way it is being developed and put out there for use. Uh, whether it's a matter of competition or lack of understanding of the human rights and freedoms impact uh, more broadly. Um, can we even consider the idea of having ethical AI? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to have AI driven by various ideologies leading to yet a completely new field, worlds of challenges? Mm. Yes, yeah, so AI, like I think any technology is, is in many ways a mirror of those who create it. So whether or not you intend for your beliefs to be encoded in what you're building, it's just such a part of who you are that it does become a part of the things you build and algorithms included. Uh, in a more practical sense, we've seen that in this famous example of the Amazon hiring algorithm, right? Which it's not like the people who coded it intended for it to discriminate against certain people, but uh, Amazon's history of hiring favored men over women. So the algorithm learned to uh, exclude resumes with any indication of the person being a woman. Like uh, if somebody's on the women's lacrosse team, the resume is out of the stack. So yes, it's, it's, it's hard to um, disconnect the technology from those who create it. Right now in the AI governance and standards space, there's a, a debate going on between whether it is better to adopt a risks-based approach, which is what the EU is doing, or a rights-based approach. The difference is that risk-based approaches are more contextual. They're based on how it's being used and what contexts uh, the tech is being used. And rights-based is user-centered and the principles are applied evenly across all use cases. The EU approach, of course, has these uh, multiple risk categories, which then require different uh, requirements and reporting, uh, reporting data points. Mm -hmm. The rights-based approach, in my opinion, would be more feasible in the long term, because right now we do not know uh, what the impact of the rollout of any AI-based tool will be. Uh, it's not like it's an easily or it's not like these rollouts are happening in bounded systems where you can easily predict what's going to happen people are inherently complicated systems are inherently complicated so the impacts are not predictable so you can't really base it on okay we think this is going to be risky this is not as risky it should be more rights based so yeah that's an interesting debate right now. Yeah, and I think it's also just like with decentralized web I think this this is going to be a conversation that will continue taking place and shaping uh, simply because of the perceptions, the understanding, or just trying to understand. And what's next? What's what's our future? Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for coming and joining us uh, for, 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 this, for this conversation. I really hope that uh, we keep this conversation going and I'm, I'm certain there will be ample opportunities. Uh, thank you all for, for joining as well and staying tuned and um, 
have a great rest of the day.